time for us to get all the good scoop on what is happening with the economy right now, because there's a lot going on with the economy that has nothing to do with all the stuff that we've been hearing about the debt ceiling for the past several weeks, but everything else. And there's no better person for us to talk to about those things than Zach Abraham, who is the chief investment officer at Bulwark Capital Management. Zach, once again, it's great to have you here. Tell us what is going on in the world of economics. Yeah, well, <clears throat> you mentioned the debt ceiling. We're, we're, we're going to have uh, some resolution to that probably here in, in the next week or so. Kind of like I said, a lot of it's going to be just kind of kabuki theater. I think people on both sides know that, you know, regardless of the rhetoric, it has to happen. So, um, but an interesting thing is going to happen after that. One of the things that we track here, and um, I'm going to try to avoid getting into the weeds on this, but one of the interesting things about markets is that since we went to 0% interest rates after 08, 09, we track a lot of different indicators. And, and the indicator that if you put up the market, a chart of the market over the, like the last 15 years, and you can track, you can overlay all of these things over the top of that chart to try to see what corresponds best. Like what, what is impacting it, right? We have a down move. What, 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 what made that down move happen? What made the up move happen? And the number one correlation you see over the last 15 years, um, more so than ever before, is liquidity. Okay, so when money is pumping into the system, the stock market goes up regardless of economic conditions. When money starts coming out of the system, the inverse happens. And the chart over the last 15 years is striking because you see it has more to do with liquidity than it does earnings, profits, revenue. The thing that it corresponds the best to is liquidity. And it actually makes sense in a 0% interest rate world markets effectively become liquidity gauges, meaning, you know, I've always equated to 0% interest rates. Now we're not at 0% interest rates right now, but the market is still behaving as if we are. Okay. So, and I okay. and it just, yeah, it kind of takes a little while for things to change, right. For people to take, um, you know, for markets to accept changes, you know, and, and, and fully bake them in. But what you've seen and everybody's like, oh, we've got a great rally happening here in the markets and it must be a rebound and new bull market. Well, what happened was after Silicon Valley Bank, the Fed raising rates, doing everything they were doing, QT, quantitative tightening, selling assets off their balance sheets, all of those actions suck liquidity out of the markets. Well, in an effort to stop the banking crisis, the Fed introduced a lending facility and they they bought about three or four hundred billion dollars worth of bonds off bank balance sheets. And that is an injection of liquidity back into the system. As soon as they did that, this rally took off. Right. And people are sitting there going, why are these stuff? You know, like Apple stock is up 35 percent after posting two consecutive quarters of five and six percent declines in revenue, 13 percent declines in profit, and even their margins are constricting. Why would that push the stock 35 percent up? Right. That's crazy. Well, liquidity went up. And the interesting thing about the debt ceiling is as soon as the debt ceiling gets passed, the Treasury is now able to issue more debt. Right. Oh, no. Well, when they issue more debt, buyers have to step in and buy that. And that begins the liquidity drain out of the market again. Right. So that's where liquidity will start pulling back. So we are watching liquidity like a hawk. It is dwindling. It is in, in many measures. It's dropping at a rate that we've never seen before. Um, like M2, the money supply, you're seeing a pullback in the money supply that we've never seen in history. It's like a tide. Uh, it is. It really, it, it very kind of much freaky. is. It yeah. is. It's kind of crazy. And, and it's intentional too, right? Because that's what the Fed is trying to do in order to bring down inflation. So we're just sitting there saying, look, we think it's pretty simple at this point. The fundamentals at, at, as we speak right now are not there to support stock prices where they are or or most asset prices the reason they've been able to do this is just because there's been a flood of liquidity as that liquidity or that tide goes out as daisy put it right we expect you know stuff to start hitting the fan again so 
where I think a lot of people are going to be like, oh, the debt ceiling, we, we got it behind us. We're good to go. I think it's going to be the opposite, right? Because that's, they're going to start issuing the debt that starts sucking liquidity out of the markets. So we'll see. But, so like the, t- so that tide will go out. It'll give people like a false sense of security. And then yeah. the, then the crap will really hit the fan. Yeah. Like and, and yeah. And, and if you really. think about it, it makes sense because you look over the last 15 years, right? You guys remember like governments intervened directly into economies or markets you know, like once every 10 years, maybe once every yeah. 15 years. Now it's like every other week. Right. And so they've trained markets. It's like a Pavlovian response. They've trained it when liquidity goes up, buy everything. When liquidity goes down, run. And now with interest rates where they're at, the biggest contraction in M2, the debt ceiling behind us, you're about to see a record debt issuance coming out of the treasury. Um, all of the, you guys mentioned student loans, student loans coming back on tap. Everywhere you look in the economy, all you see are liquidity drains, right? So th- then you go over and you start looking at the economic data. Not only are central banks draining liquidity, but the economic data is still, the trend is very much down. It is opposite of the market so far. Um, and we've seen this happen before. We People forget, but 2008, Bear Stearns, it's funny. I don't know if we've talked about this before, but go back to 2008. This is a different economic backdrop, but March 16th of 2008 is when Bear Stearns failed. Everybody panicked. And then about a month after that happened, the market started rallying again. Everybody's like, oh, we're in good shape, right? Silicon Valley failed on March 10th. Okay. So, you know, about six days apart, market got hit. Then we start rallying again. There's just so many similarities. Um, again, the economic situation is different. The market reactions and the market behavior are very similar. We'll see what the outcome is. But, you know, we were talking about jobs data off the air. Um, we've been saying for a long time, look, the labor market is still, quote unquote, strong, but we just think it's way overstated. Well, funny enough, jobs data came out and there now you got to go. You're not going to see a headline on CNBC. You know, Rachel Maddow isn't going to be preaching this from the from the rooftops, but you'll see it in the bullet points. They they said, okay, yeah, job growth is good. By the way, uh, we overstated jobs by five hundred thousand in the in Q four of last year. Right. Our bad. Yeah. uh, Yeah. And isn't isn't it it weird that 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 their their miscalculations always tend to benefit Right. The, the, the administration. Right. It's mm-hmm. never they never accidentally didn't credit 500,000. Exactly. 500,000 yeah. over counting. Mm-hmm. So um, when you look at, you know, the, the other narrative to look at is, oh, it's the jobs. It's the jobs. Well, first of all, jobs are always the last thing to give out in a recession. It's always the last thing to roll over. And it's pretty simple. Business owners don't cut people in anticipation of business slowdowns. Right. Because if they Mm -hmm. don't slow down, then they don't want to lose the employee, especially in a tight labor market. So it's always the last thing to roll over. But one of the ways that you can kind of, in our opinion, tell that the jobs market isn't nearly as strong as people are saying is you look at hours worked and you look at overtime hours. Right. Meaning if if I see a really job uh, strong jobs number and I see overtime hours increasing, I can believe that jobs number. If you're show, telling me that you've got a historically tight jobs market and overtime hours are going down, I don't I don't believe your job numbers, right? Because mm-hmm. what do employers do, especially in a period of time like right now when labor costs have gone up and the labor and the labor market's really tight? They're going to offer existing employees overtime before they bring on somebody else, right? So you're seeing overtime hours going down. You're seeing work weekly hours going down. Uh, they revised that 500,000 out of the jobs number. So in our opinion, if you're looking at the data and the fundamentals of the economy, they're telling a completely different story than the markets are at this point. Huh. So what what should people be doing? I mean, how does this affect, like, what's the Fed going to do next? Or what, what, what do you anticipate is going to happen with interest rates? How should people be buckling up 
to get yeah, through and, this. And by people, Miriam's talking about herself because I can see her freaking out as you're speaking. <laughs> I'm like I, freaking out. I can totally Every see on her day. face. Like I'm watching her face and she's like literally freaking out the whole time you're yeah. talking. I can tell. Yeah. 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 <laughs> when well, am I going to be able to get eggs for like a normal price? When is gas going to be cheaper? When is all of this right. going to be better? And, yeah, yeah. People freak out about all this stuff. It's not, it's not even just that, but like we're all freaking out about, you know, retirement and like paying our kids way through college and just, and you're right, just to everyday things. People are freaking out out there. Yeah. 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 And I, and I think one of the things we talk to our, our clients about all the time is we freak out when we don't have a plan. Right. right. Um, and one of the things that we talk about at our firm is that with every investment, you, you have to do, you have to embrace a risk. You're either embracing the risk of underperformance as it relates to other investments or you're embracing the risk of catastrophic loss. Okay. I look at this as kind of markets are like seasons. There's times where I want to embrace the risk of catastrophic loss because the upside is so compelling, right? Meaning I'm buying a stock at two times earnings that has no debt on the balance sheet and is growing revenue at 20% a year. And it's like taking candy from a baby, right? It's like, if I buy this company and hold it for any period of time, I'm guaranteed to win. Okay, that's when I want to embrace the cost. When we're looking at this market right now, in my opinion, it's the opposite, meaning you have this S&P trading at 25 times earnings. Okay, just just to give you guys an idea of what that means, everybody throws these words out, they're complicated. But honestly, it's just looking at the average company and saying, okay, you make a million dollars a year profit. How much am I willing to pay for that company that makes a million dollars a year profit? Right now, the market's saying we'll pay $25 million for a company making a million dollars a year. Okay. Wow. It, it's been higher than that, but that is 50% above the long-term average valuation on the market. When interest rates are at 0%, that, that valuation kind of makes sense because if I go buy bonds, I'm not getting paid anything, right? But if you show me a way to make a risk-free 3% on my, or excuse me, 5% mm -hmm. on my money with short-term treasuries... It, versus buying stocks at 25 times earnings in a slowing economy. You know, maybe maybe we don't have some big economic catastrophe in, catastrophe in front of us, but why if we're watching, we all know the economy is weakening. Why are we willing to pay 50% above the long-term average on valuation? So in these, in, in these situations, we pull back our exposure. We own a big chunk of short-term and medium-term U.S. government bonds that are paying us 5% interest. People are like, they're afraid of U.S. government bonds. Don't be. <laughs> and, and buy them not because you believe in the U.S. government, but because you believe in every government less. Okay? <laughs> because people forget investments are a relative game, right? It's, it's, people go, is it good or bad investment? You go, well, compared to what? Right? Mm -hmm. And so the cleanest, dirty shirt gets picked. And that's kind of <laughs> why U.S. government bonds are going to do good. It's not an attestation of the strength or solvency of the U.S. government. It's just a story about how bad everybody else is, yeah. right? Yeah. And then we own some, and then we own some dividend-paying, you know, type energy stocks because they're still dirt cheap, and we want protection from inflation. Um, and then it's, it's just diversification, bringing that risk level down. And then we're like shoppers, right? We're just waiting for that Nordstrom half yearly sale, right? We're just saying, Hey, we got the half yearly sale six months down the road here. We're going to wait till then we're going to sit here and collect our coupons and our interest and wait till then. Now, could we be wrong? Sure. You can always be wrong in this game, right? But if us being wrong means our clients make five to 7% and the market's up 11, I'm not happy about that, but that's not a bad outcome, right? However, it's not a loss. We're, right. It's not right. a loss. We're still yeah. moving ahead. However, if our outlook is right and our clients make three to 5% and the market's down 30, now we didn't lose. And on top of that, we've got 5% more to go buy stocks that are down 30%, right? Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. didn't take a hit. So right now, I would just tell people, you know, you will see it in the culture right now. I think part of it is, you know, just cultural in general. Part of it's we've gone too long without a recession. Part of it's that people have been making too much money. And everybody right now, the predominant sentiment, probably not with listeners to your show and not our clients, but the predominant sentiment out there is worried about missing out on future gains. I just don't think this is a time where that should be your concern. 
Yeah. Well, that is good advice. And it's just a taste of the kind of advice that you can hear if you check out Zach Abraham at knowyourriskradio.com. And you should. Where else can people find out more about Bulwark Capital Management and you? Yeah. So uh, bulwarkcapitalmanagement.com, like you said, you can just Google Know Your Risk Radio podcast. I do an hourly show and then we do uh, usually two or three times a month, we do hourly interviews or hour long interviews, kind of the Joe Rogan style, right? Long form interviews uh, with other money managers, other economists, things of that nature. And then uh, they can always follow me on Twitter at at KYR radio. Love it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the update. Always appreciate it.